Okay, welcome back. It's been so long. So this time we are going to talk about two of the four trait approaches that we're going to approach. Yeah, I'm going to leave that in. So the single trait approach, these are very shocking techniques, obviously. So this research approach focuses on a single trait. Um, so what I mean by that is they literally will pick one main trait and then see how that one trait relates to multiple behaviors. This is kind of a tactic to make research a little more manageable. So again, this is getting away from the like one big theory a aspiration that personality psychology would like. And so this is just one approach within the trait paradigm. So you examine one trait, many behaviors. Now there are a lot of traits, a lot. So Warren Norman of uh, Michigan had a pared down trait list of 2,800 words, different traits. And we'll talk more about like how they came to this approach. Essentially, this is a distilled list from the dictionary of adjectives. It's a lot. And all of them have kind of ratings attached to them. So you are welcome to check out this entire list in the appendix of this file that I've linked here. It starts in appendix zero. And so there are a lot. I'm going to zoom in to give you a sense of what what these mean. And so they're all sorted and categorized and rated. And a lot of these traits are pretty similar, but each of these traits is going to be related to lots of different behaviors. So we could focus on being a teetot like the teetotaler trait and just see all the things that that's related to, what behaviors. Most likely it relates to not drinking because that's what teetotalers, it's a kind of a blast from the past vocab word. Some of these are really, really similar to each other, like, um, wow, I'm, I'm blanking on how to pick one. Uh, so like, smart alecky and smarty, they have a little bit of tone difference. But, well, that took me way too long to fix, but there's a lot of similar words that probably cluster together. And there might even be some key essential traits. But in the interim, this research approach is you pick one trait and you see all the behaviors it links with. So here's a kind of classic trait, like single trait, self-monitoring. Now I've got a definition for you here. Um, it's so the degree to which inner and outer selves and behaviors are the same or different um, across situations. So high self-monitors have discrepant selves and uh, behave behaviors. Uh, they look for cues and situations for how to act and how to adjust their behaviors. So it's not necessary to be, like it's, uh, let me, before I like, give you some more spiel, let me tell you what a low self-monitor is. So low self-monitors are similar selves, have similar selves and behaviors across like most situations. They're more consistent, uh, they're more guided by their inner personality. Now it's not necessarily better to be a high self-monitor or a low self-monitor. Both of these kind of extreme poles have both positive and negative implications as well as correlations. So, um, actors tend to be really high self-monitors because they need to be able to perform and act in their scene. Now, um, mental patients have really low scores of self-monitoring. Now, that's not to say that I really need to put in a better example here. Like, they are almost off below the charts, like, on levels of self-monitoring. Now, other examples of self-monitors, I'm a very low self-monitor. So what you see is what you get. Uh, how I am in front of the camera is how I am in front of the classroom. It's how I am 
in the office, in the department, and at home. Uh, what you see is what you get. There's, I, I can self-monitor, like I can do it in high stakes situations where it's necessary, but for me personally, it's very exhausting. I would much rather be me. But that also has, so it's got some great advantages. You'll know exactly where I stand on anything. I'm not gonna hide my opinions. Um, but yeah, so now cor there are a lot of correlations with this in terms of also higher self monitors are better at performing in job interviews. Now you can kind of adjust your self monitoring as I just kind of talked about. So a high stakes situation, I'll self monitor. I'll do it because I know that it in the long run it was a better choice. So it's not like you're either high or low. There's still some variability where you can be at any one time. Um, now there are some big downsides to high self monitors. So they're willing to lie to get a date, which um, in general, like, so just because you're a high self monitor doesn't mean that you're a liar, but what it does mean is like, it's something you're more capable of doing than someone who is a low self monitor who doesn't really tailor themselves to the situation. So other single trade approaches, I've linked, so I've provided this uh, YouTube video, this TED talk by uh, Keith Campbell, um, who, who I, last time I spoke with him, he was at Georgia University of, he, so he's an awesome dude. But yeah, so Keith does, knows a lot about Narsen, so I really encourage you to check out this TED talk, or this TED drawing thing and let me actually tell you what narcissism is so narcissism is like from a definition standpoint is excessive self-love it is linked with being manipulative overbearing high levels of narcissism vain so on and so forth you're actually more likely to not wear a mask if you're a narcissist there's some cool papers that have come out really really recently um like within like I read the paper yesterday, so very recently. So um, they're less likely to care about other people and alter their behaviors to so extreme levels to alter their behaviors for the benefit of others. Um, so yeah, now they're manip so uh, how they're described by others, uh, by how they know them for that you're, bleh. I'm gonna leave this in, so let me back up a little. So, narcissism, at first, they make really great first impressions, charming, all that stuff, but as you get to know them, a lot of their peers will eventually start to describe them as manipulative, overbearing, vain, and so on. But their first impressions, really spot on, really great. Initially, they're super likable, but High levels of narcissism, not the personality disorder, but just the trait. Um, everybody has some level of this trait, so no one is like without narcissism. You could be low on narcissism, high on narcissism, but everybody has falls on a continuum somewhere. So it, it's linked with many behaviors and attributes, uh, such as uh, aggression when positive when their positive self view is threatened. Uh, they don't handle failure well. They uh, tend to be tend to argue and swear a lot. And these are all based on research studies, and all of these research studies that I'm citing intentionally are findings from before 2016. So it's not just a recent f interest from scholars. So you may ask yourself, why do they act like that? So it's it's an attempt to defend their unrealistically inflated self-concept. So there's a general, there are some general failures to control impulses and degra delay gratification. So not all narcissism is bad before I like keep going. I know I hinted at this a little, but um, people who have higher levels of narcissism tend to also be like higher in leadership and authority and have higher self-confidence and charisma and popularity 
power and life satisfaction. So up to some, like, on a continuum, so like if we were to have this as a scale of like 0 to 7, someone who's a 7 is really, really strong on this trait. Uh, but someone who's like a 6 or a 5 or a 4, less strong. And so they're like, it's not all bad, is what I'm trying to say here. That there's, there's advantage. If there was zero advantage, and we'll talk about this in the evolutionary psych unit, uh, if there was zero advantage for this trait, and it was all downside, it likely would no longer exist in the population. There has, to, in general, there has to be some advantage, at least at some levels, maybe not the most extreme levels, but for like slightly less extreme, it's helpful. It's good to have leadership ability. It's good to think that you're awesome. It, like having a really fragile self-esteem, not so hot. Um, okay. Oh, apparently I have had this embedded twice. Okay, here we go. So that was a single trait approach. Okay, now we're on to the many trait approach. So you pick an important behavior. So you examine the correlations between one behavior and many traits. So it's the exact flip. So the single trait approach, you look at one trait, many behaviors. The many trait approach, you look at many traits and the relationship with one behavior. So uh, now there's some really cool, well-established examples of personality measurement. And I've got, I've linked to some of these uh, that I recorded last semester with during the COVID disruption. And so you're welcome to check those out. They go into great, a lot more detail about like the California Q set, which I will call the California Q sort. And I do not know why, but it will come out of my mouth. So anytime you hear Q sort, what I really mean is Q set. It's a uh, hundred different personality descriptions uh, that are supposed to describe you in terms of phrases, they're slightly more complex than single word traits. And how you f complete this survey is you sort all the traits into kind of a forced choice, normal distribution. I've got a picture on the next page that makes this much clearer. And the idea is that you're comparing all 100 of these characteristics within the same person. So only a couple of those traits can be really, really descriptive of you. Most of them are kind of descriptive. Some of them are really not descriptive. Um, I'm going to show you what this distribution looks like and then bounce back to talk about some of the items. So here, uh, you classify certain items as uncharacteristic, most of them neutral, some is super characteristic, and it follows a bell-shaped curve. In terms of examples, uh, is unpredictable, Sorry, the, the camera is right here. And I... oh, there, now I can read it. So, uh, is unpredictable and changeable in behaviors and attitudes. Is vulnerable to real or fancy threat. Generally fearful. Um, is a talkative individual. These are like distinct little phrases and you have to place them in this distribution. So you're only allowed to have five that are super characteristic of you, but you're also only allowed to have five that are super uncharacteristic. Most are in the middle where you're like, I eh, guess kinda. So you have to, so it forces you to choose. Hence first, forced choice. That's what it's called. Okay, so more of the many trade approach. What is this useful for? Uh, so word use actually is linked. So certain words, and these count as behaviors, so you can see what kinds of words are commonly associated with which traits. Uh, so words, certainty words, so words like absolutely, exactly, truly, like precise kind of words like that are related to being perceived as intelligent, verbally fluent. And people are generally, who are use these kind of phrases, are turned to for advice. They're also considered more ambitious and generous. All very useful things. So. Those might be words you, if you would like to be perceived as intelligent or more verbally facile, or if you really want people to turn to you for advice, use these words. If you want, if you don't want people to turn to you for advice, 
cut those words out of your language. Obviously, it's not that determinative, but um, it's one tactic that might work. So we also can look at depression for this. So uh, for girls who were diagnosed with depression at age 18 were related to being described as a shy, over-socialized, self-punishing, and over-controlled at age 7. So what they did was they got all this data from the kids age 7, they waited 12 years, and then looked at how they, um, how, if there were distinguishing features between those that had depression and those that didn't. Same with boys, but the interesting thing is, like, kind of the flip. So, um, so boys who had depression at 18 were described at age 7 as under-socialized. So contrast that with girl behavior being aggressive and under-controlled. So either there's some kind of gender effect going on here, or there, there's clearly a gender effect, either in how it's being diagnosed or how it's expressed. And so it's... but. The idea here is you can see how many different traits relate to the same be kind of behavior or specific outcome of choice. Okay, so that was it for the single trait and multi-trait approach. There's a lot more detail in the book that I encourage you to check out. It fleshes out some of these examples a lot more. Um, but next time, we're going to talk about the essential trait approach. So this is the big five. This is the, like... It's what we've been building towards. We're going to be using the Big Five for the rest of the semester. It's a really helpful lens to how to orient yourself for the rest of the units. And it's also really, like, it, it's a really helpful framework. Especially helpful for the biological approach that's coming up next. So yeah, that is where we're going. And I don't know why the default icon was a football. But it, I, but it was. So I kept it. For my own kicks and giggles. So uh, thanks for watching. I You'll see me in the next episode. And bye-bye. Uh,